seats over here. I don't want anybody to feel like they have to stand. There's some stools under those high top tables too, so whatever makes you comfortable um, is perfectly good. We good? Okay. We're good. Well, welcome. Um, I, I suspect most of us, if not all of us, uh, know each other, but on behalf of my mom, Janet, and my brothers, Matt and Sam, and my sister, Lindsay, thank you uh, for being here. Craig's Family and friends are spread out uh, all over the country, and so we don't take for granted that you're here. We know there are some folks that wanted to be here, um, but sometimes life just gets in the way and, uh, and they can't, and so we're thinking of them as well. Uh, I think if this was one of our memorials, Craig would have already told my mom when, what time he hoped to leave. <laughs> and so um, we, won't, we won't try to uh, laugh a little and, and cry a little together and uh, remember together and, uh, and look forward together to a reunion uh, when we see Craig again. And then we'll wrap things up, uh, mainly so I don't have to listen to him make fun of me for rambling on and on the next time I see him. So, uh, if the only thing that somebody knew about Craig was what they read in his obituary, this is what they would know. Craig Carl Gross, 75. Passed away peacefully on Thursday, August 15th, 2024, at his home in Merle's Inlet, South Carolina. He was born on March 15th, 1949, in Elmira, New York, to the late Mervyn and Edith Johnson Gross. By the time he graduated high school, Craig added fluency in Italian and proficiency in Latin to his native English. He applied his love of languages and earned a degree in Spanish from Niagara University before proudly serving our country in the United States Army. Following his honorable discharge, he returned to school and graduated first in his class with a second degree, this time in accounting from SUNY Cornell. When Craig wasn't watching the Braves, we would often find him on a basketball or tennis court, a baseball or softball field, or eagerly putting his fishing rods or golf clubs to use. Craig's love of playing sports was exceeded only by the joy he found being his children and grandchildren's biggest cheerleader. While living in Kentucky, Craig worked as a bookkeeper and was an active member of Grace Baptist Church. Throughout his 28-year battle with cancer and the degenerative effects of its treatment, Craig maintained an overflowing pride in and abiding love for his family. He will be deeply missed. Left to cherish his memory are his wife of over 35 years, Janet Shannon Gross, his sons, Matthew Gross, his wife, Kim, Sam Gross, and Ashley, stepchildren, Chip Robinson and wife, Kristen, and Lindsay Robinson. 14 grandchildren, Ariel, Sabrin, Lily, Reese, and Maggie Gross, Aubrey and Bradley Gross, Berkeley, Avery, and Emery Robinson, Colton, Phoebe, Kaylin, and Peyton Robinson. His brother, Merv Gross, and wife, Jenny. Sister, Roxanne Stevens, and husband, Jack, as well as several beloved nieces, nephews, and cousins. A large, loving, extended family, and many supportive friends and neighbors. Obviously, no obituary, no memorial service can ever really summarize the fullness of a life, but we'll do our best. We'll begin by praying and asking for the Lord's help. Mm. Father, the psalmist wrote, Blessed is the one who takes refuge in the Lord. We take refuge in you this morning as we remember, as we mourn, as we give you praise for Craig's life, your adopted son by grace through faith. Your word promises that you are near to the brokenhearted. Your son Jesus was a man acquainted with grief and sorrow. And yet, Father, we cling to the promise of 1 Thessalonians 4 that we grieve as those with hope because of the resurrection. 
And so as we begin, we ask for your spirit's presence, for his comfort, and for the joy that comes from knowing that though Craig has died, yet shall he live. Would you be with us now? We look to you, knowing that you are a God of steadfast love and faithfulness. We make our boast in you, our strong tower, our comforter, our good shepherd, especially in times like these. In Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. In uh, Isaiah 40, the Lord speaks to his prophet and gives him a message to give to his people. His people have been conquered by the Babylonians, exiled from their homeland. Many have died during the invasion or on the journey north. They are tired, confused, hurting, and wondering where God is in all of this. And to them, the Lord says through the prophet Isaiah, Verses 1 to 8 of chapter 40. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her hardship is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, and she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry. And I say, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Skipping down to verse 28. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. 28 years is a long time to fight cancer and to deal with the effects of its treatment. These last few years, Craig <coughs> has grown faint and weary. He was exhausted all the time. He had no might left. He waited on the Lord to call him home. And we now believe by faith that his hardship has ended. His iniquity has been pardoned. His strength has been renewed. He can run and not grow weary. He can walk and not faint again for the first time in a very, very long time. He has experienced the fullness of God's grace now. God's grace is also with us who remain here. And his word speaks comfort to us. It speaks tenderly to us and reminds us that though our lives wither and fade, the word of the Lord will stand forever. Would you take a moment to reflect, or to pray, to remember, to thank God for his amazing grace? As my friend Amy said. Whoa. 
don't know why it sounds like somebody logging the forest somewhere nearby. I don't, can you all hear that? I don't know what that is. Sorry. I don't think it's in the building. But, um, as she was going through his things, my mom found a letter that Craig wrote. And I'm not going to read all of it, but I wanted to share uh, a lot of it. Our best guess is that he wrote it sometime around 2009. Um, his strokes had started by then. He was on disability, he couldn't drive anymore. Um, and I think the sobering reality um, must have caused him to think about a day like this. Uh, I don't think he knew that this day was gonna take another 15 years to get here, um, but he was obviously thinking about it back then. So here's some of what he wrote to us. I just wanted to thank everyone for coming today. If it is possible, I will miss everyone here immensely. You, my friends, have all been a blessing to me in my life, and I think and I thank you now. To my brother and sisters, I wish I'd made myself closer with you. For all that is left, that's what I should have done. To my boys, I never lost my love for you and thought about you every day. I thank Janet for blessing me with two sons and for her amazing upbringing of them. I know she will never leave you, so hold on to your mother and revel in her love for you. I thank Janet for giving me 20 plus years. It turned out to be 35 plus, but again, this was in 2009. Of love and respect and companionship, as I know how hard that was to do. She brought Chip and Lindsay into my life, and I'm forever grateful for that. I can't begin to list every one of you who affected my life so wonderfully because I would leave someone out. Let me just say together, you have all been a great part of my life and I will surely miss each and every one of you. By the way, and this is where the pre-cancer Craig comes out the most. By the way, I'm not really dead, just electro electrocardiographically challenged <laughs> and brainwave deficient. <laughs> In the early kind of pre-political controversial days of the Rush Limbaugh show, Craig just thought it was the funniest thing in the world when someone famous would die and Rush would say that they had assumed room temperature. So, I'm surprised he didn't slide that. I hope the mortician put a smile on my face. There was a point in time before they moved where uh, you know, they changed their mind and decided on cremation later, but time you wrote this. I hope the mortician put a smile on my face because that's what I love to do, especially since my teeth got fixed. <laughs> now I go to join my mother and father. What a joy that will be. I miss them greatly in my life. My father was taken away too early in his life. To me, he was the greatest. And although my memories of him faded during my life, my anticipation of being with him again makes me as happy as anyone could ever be. If I had to die to see him, it's worth it. My mom died June 5th, 2007, and left a blank space in my life. Because I spent most of my youth and early adulthood with her, I have wonderful, crazy memories of her. She was indeed a unique woman. A lot of what I became in my person was taken from her. We will have such a great time now. I have to thank my sister, Roxanne, and my brother, Jack, the incredible thing they did by taking mom into their house. God allowed them to step up and for their hearts to be so filled with such caring, compassion, and love, I'm eternally grateful to them. I know this is kind of long and rambling, but it's very important to me. Although I lay here in front of you, again, plans change. Although I lay here in front of you deader than a doornail, <laughs> My wish, my wish is that I will live in your wonderful hearts and memories for a long time. God bless each and every one of you here. Now, grab a finger sandwich and have a beer. I love you all. Please, no tears. Just smiles. Signed, Craig, Mr. Craig, Skipper, Pop. So I'm tempted to just pray and eat. <laughs> um, but that letter was about other people. It wasn't about Craig or Skipper or Papa. 
as I've reflected over the last two weeks, what I keep coming back to is how there really was two credits. I know his cancer treatment started in 1996, but the first stroke happened in 2004. And so there was kind of Craig before the stroke started, and then there was Craig after. So Lily and Reese and Maggie, and Aubrey and Bradley, Colton, Berkeley and Emery and Avery, the rest of us here really wish that you had known Poppy before he got sick. That Craig was a handful. <laughs> As his good friend Rudy would often say, that Craig was just not right. <laughs> Usually he meant that in a good way. <laughs> Craig was different after he got sick. Craig graduated from Southside High School in Elmira, New York in 1967. That was his last day of high school. It was probably better than his first day of his senior year, on which he was literally arrested and let out of school in handcuffs. <laughs> Turned out it was a case of mistaken identity. <laughs> he may or may not have scaled the public pool's fence, but we are assured he did not, in fact, break into the concession stand. <laughs> he had, however, made it a habit to steal deodorant. Don't know why think perhaps that was the only thing you could steal without being caught but one day Nona opened up a drawer and there it was filled to the brim with men's deodorant lifetime supply Nona marched him right back down to the store and made him confess and I remember when we went up to New York for Nona's funeral him laughing and laughing and laughing about how he and all of his high school friends would stash flathead screwdrivers on the top of phone booths all over Elmira so that they could come back and grab those things that pop open parking machines, parking <laughs> meters to get the change. <laughs> oh, as an adult, he proudly served as a treasurer at Grace Baptist Church. <laughs> I don't think he told them about the party. <laughs> Moved around a lot because dad is in the army. And he loved his time in Italy. He played semi-pro baseball. Uh, and he was proud to have been the only person on the team who could speak both English and Italian. And so he served as the interpreter both on the team and at home with his folks. And he won a national award in Italy as a Latin scholar. He loved languages. Loved to learn them. Loved to learn about them. He loved driving compact pickup trucks. <laughs> Far beyond their reasonable, useful life. Well beyond the useful life of the bald retread tires that he, for some reason, insisted on putting on them. I drove that truck for over 20 years. I don't think he ever put a set of new tires <laughs> He would pile retread tires in the back, in mounds, so that when the truck inevitably blew a retread and it was flapping around on the inside <laughs> fender. He could just pull over and put a new retread on and keep going. I don't think he ever took an empty paper coffee cup out of the floorboard of it. I know he never took an empty bark cigarette pack out of the seat behind it. <laughs> um, but he loved to laugh at himself driving around in that truck. He loved to laugh in general, most often at his own jokes whether you laughed or not. <laughs> sometimes those jokes are a bit off color. Sometimes they could sting if you were the butt of them. Often they were stolen from Rodney Dangerfield or George Carlin or Dave Barry. They liked to poke fun at himself and at you. For better or worse, whether it was the right time or not, <laughs> laughing with you or at you was his way of bonding. Laughter and sports. Craig loved sports. We go to the park and shoot basketball or play tennis against the wall by himself for hours and hours on the hottest days of the summer. He played third base for Grace Baptist like he was trying out for the Braves. <laughs> he loved to fish, especially with his boys. Finding a pond or a pay lake 
to go fishing a cave run with his boys was about as good as it got. Me and Matt are going fishing was a great day for Craig. He loved watching the Braves a long time before they got good in the 90s. <laughs> but none of that compared to how much he loved watching his kids and stepkids and grandkids play or perform. He could not wait to get off work and drive that truck to Moorhead, to watch Matt or Sam play basketball or baseball or soccer or run cross country. I remember uh, one night, he gets back and he's beaming with pride. And he can't wait to tell us this story. And he says, he's so excited. He says, Sam's out there and I yell at Sam, Sam, I need one. I need one, Sammy. And he goes right down and scores. And he just thought that was the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> he was amazed at Lindsay's performances in speech and drama and in plays and her ability to memorize and to enter into the character. You wouldn't know it to look at me now, but I wrestled in high school. <laughs> and Craig loved the joke that I could tell you the number of lights on the ceiling in every gym. <laughs> I'm convinced he thought all 14 grandkids were going to go pro in something. <laughs> it was pure joy for him to watch or to hear about or see pictures of you all playing or marching or performing. He, by the time you were doing those things, couldn't run up and down the sideline anymore. He couldn't scream from the stands anymore. But in his heart, he was. Your poppy was so very, very proud of each and every one of you. And mom, he was proud to be your husband. 35 years is a long time to be married. A lot of ups, a lot of downs. Lots of laughter, lots of tears, lots of days that you two probably hoped would never end, and seasons that seemed like they would never end. I know that he felt undeserved of you. Because he told me that a lot, especially after you guys moved in 2018 and that last big stroke happened. It wasn't easy to be married to Craig, but your commitment to loving him, even when he was hard to love, the way you honored your vows, for better or worse, the way you served as a caretaker for 28 of your 35 years of marriage is a testament to your character, and I believe God will honor that in the years ahead. You all never really got to experience living at the beach the way you'd imagined it all those years. And Craig knew that. But taking care of him was hard. I think harder than any of us really know. But he knew that too. And he lamented it. He regretted it. He wished he could change it. But some things are just out of our control. Things like cancer and scar tissue. Things like divorces that put distance between fathers and sons. Things like the reality that no one is perfect. We all sin and fall short of God's perfect plan for us. And Craig wasn't perfect. But just because he's past doesn't mean that we need to pretend he was. Because none of us are. He was selfish at times. And he could be mean-spirited at times. I think he always saw himself as a bit of an outsider. And he kind of liked that role. And sometimes he wore it as a bit of armor. And like a lot of people who suffer from non-traumatic brain injuries, like strokes, his illness sometimes exacerbated the worst in him, not the best. But as someone who loved him, and as a Christian, I can tell you with confidence that I believe those broken places have been healed. And those sinful patterns and sinful moments have been forgiven. I believe that the worst has passed away. What remains has been remade and perfected. And I say that because I believe that Craig was a Christian. He professed faith on Nona's birthday, October 31st, 1993. He used to refer to himself as a Reformed Lutheran. And he didn't mean it theologically. <laughs> he meant, like, I managed to not be a Lutheran anymore. <laughs> Went to Catholic school. But he professed faith in 1993. We talked about faith 
less than 24 hours before he died. He was unwavering in his belief that Jesus was his Lord and Savior. And he really only had two questions that night. One was, do you think it's possible for me to know when it's my time to go? As it turns out, he did know. The other one was, do you think my dad will recognize me? And I'm confident he did. Craig believed what I believe, what Christians have professed for thousands of years. That God created everything that is. That he created it good. He created it out of nothing. That our response to God's good creation was rebellion. From our first parents, Adam and Eve, to us, we've all chosen our own way. We've all fallen short and decided we knew better. Our sin has broken the relationship that we have with God, with one another, with the way that we care for even the creation itself. But God's response to our rebellion and sin was to send his son on a rescue mission. To live the life we should have lived but haven't. To die a death that we deserve in our place as our substitute. And to prove that the promises of God are trustworthy by being raised again on the third day. That gospel good news is God's promise that all who believe in that will be saved. Saved by grace through faith. And I believe that Craig was saved. Not because he was a good guy, though he was. Not because he loved his family, though he did deeply. Not because he went to church, although he did until he couldn't do it anymore physically. I'm confident that Craig was welcomed into the joy of his master in August of 2024 because he believed that Jesus died for his sins and was raised again. Not because he was perfect but because Jesus was perfect in his place. And so he inherited the promise of God. 1 Corinthians 15 says this, I tell you, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. We shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we give thanks as we grieve for the victory that is ours in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Father, would you continue to be with us and to comfort us? in the hours and weeks and years ahead. After this initial season of realizing what has been lost passes, in those moments when grief comes out of nowhere, would you help us to cling to your promise? If any here do not have the faith that Craig had, would you grant it to them? that one day they might be united with you and reunited with him. Pray for Janet during this transition that you would help her find a new normal in the years ahead. Pray for Matt and Sam and Lindsay and my family. This man who has been a part of us for so long is not anymore surely remains in our hearts. Would you help us to understand what that means now moving forward? Would you comfort us with the promise that one day death will be swallowed up in victory and death will be no more. But for now we cling to the promise of the resurrection. Would you bless us now as we fellowship together 
and we dine together, thankful for those who are serving our family during this time. Just pray that you would bless them as well. We love you. We thank you for the life of your son, Craig. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we're going to eat. <laughs> and I don't have a lot of instructions, but I know it's over there. <laughs> so, um, would you please not be shy? We're going to turn the music and the pictures back on. You can stay as long as you like. Or if you need to get on the road to head back to wherever, uh, we understand that as well. You're not going to hurt feelings um, one way or the other. Um, are there any instructions I need to give anyone, Pamela? Just eat a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, any, that I need to give. <laughs> Start over here. Start over here and just work your way this way. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Let's eat. Matt, go first, because your dad always had to be first. <laughs> Grace Matt is anywhere he was going to be first. Hi, Turn this off and turn the slide. Okay. 